six webinars in the series of webinars that are being organized by the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences for the welfare of our students so that they can keep in touch with the subject during these COVID times that are quite hard times, sitting home or at, at home all the time. So today, we'll have a webinar. Uh, the title of the webinar for today is uh, Early Adversity GQ Signaling and the Programming of uh, Psychiatric Vulnerability. So the speaker for today's webinar is uh, Professor Vidita Vaidya. As we know, these uh, uh, G proteins, they are actually uh, the guanine binding regulatory proteins that uh, mediate signal transduction in the mammalian nervous systems. So uh, the topic is quite a specialized one. And uh, I'll request uh, Professor Vedya to be as generalized and as simple as possible because uh, most of the students, they may not be having even the background knowledge about this type of the uh, subject. So uh, it will be beneficial for all the students and I'll request all of them to be careful. And uh, if you feel any uh, thing is not clear, you can always send me the question and we'll discuss it at the end of the webinar. So before we start the webinar, I'll request uh, Dr. Bharti to introduce the speaker uh, to the audience. Dr. Bharti. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Vidita Vaidya. She is a neuroscientist and professor at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. She obtained her PhD in neuroscience from Yale University, USA, worked as postdoc in Sweden and University of Oxford in UK. She has been a welcome trust overseas senior research fellow and an associate of Indian Academy of Sciences from 2000 to 2005. She was awarded the prestigious Shanti Savru Bhatnagar Prize in 2015 in the medical sciences category and is a fellow at the Indian National Science Academy. She is also a recipient of the National Bioscience Award for Career Development in 2012. She received the Nature Award for Mentorship in Science in 2019 in the mid-career category. Vidita has been featured in Leelawati's Daughters, a compilation of biographical essays on Indian women scientists and on the Life in Science blog. Recently, in January 2020, Vidita joined the editorial board of European Journal of Neuroscience as one of, the, one of a panel of four new senior editors. Vidita studies the neuro circuits that regulate emotion and how these mechanisms are influenced by life experiences and antidepressants. She also investigates how changes in brain circuits form the basis of psychiatric disorders like depression and how early life experiences contribute to persistent alterations in behavior. So please join me in welcoming Professor Vidita Vaidya for today's talk. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to do this. I just wish I was there in person in, uh, in Patiala instead of doing this uh, as a webinar. But uh, I know these are challenging times and I think it's fantastic that one continues to find a way to connect with science and scientific disciplines through this mode, at least while we're all sitting at home. Okay, so I will start sharing my screen yes. Um, yes. and I'll just check with you that you can indeed see it. Yes, um, okay. Just confirm that you can see it. Hold on a minute. Yeah. It's visible, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Terrific. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for this uh, invitation. And, uh, you know, I am a, a traditionalist at heart. Uh, talking to students that come from a department of zoology or entomology will be much more up my alley than talking perhaps to a bunch of biotechnologists. I uh, am a firm believer that there's a huge power in studying the building block uh, sort of disciplines of biology and that one shouldn't move too far away from those. While tools and technology bring in a great deal of value, they can only be used appropriately if they, we apply them to the fundamental questions of biology. So I'm very thrilled to be giving this talk to the zoology students and that community uh, at, uh, in Punjab. So 
<clears throat> let me start by saying what I'm going to talk about today. And I will try to uh, follow the advice, which is to keep it as simple as possible and also give you a broad and general overview. So this is a photograph of TIFR, which is where I work. It's on the southernmost tip of Mumbai in a beautiful location. I'll start by playing this video, which I sourced from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute website. And the reason I'm starting with this is to tell you that when you think about the nervous system, it's about 100 million, 100 billion neurons, actually. So, I mean, we're talking about an immensely complex system in which large number of cells actually divide. And during evolution, what has happened is that the cortex, which is the seat of all higher knowledge, learning, it's your ability to poet, uh, produce poetry, it's your ability to control stress responses, it's your ability to create powerful language, it's also the same circuits that perhaps drive uh, political make decision making and alliance formation. These circuits that have expanded so much in primate evolution, so us and the non-human primates have a very large um, part of the brain now dedicated to what is called the cortex. I'm just showing you a video here of what ha happens during development where progenitors that are born from radial cells at the uh, ventricular surface actually go on to populate the six-layered neocortex. The reason it's called the neocortex is it is the most new, in a sense, during evolution. And that's the region that's expanded greatly. So if you look at a, if you take a rat brain and you flatten out the cortex, you'll get a one rupee coin. If you take a monkey and you flatten out the cortex, you'll get a chapati. If you take us and you flatten out the cortex, you will get the size of a largish pizza. That just gives you a sense of the amount of surface area and territory that has really expanded during um, evolution in our nervous system. But like other mammalian and vertebrate counterparts, despite this having expanded so much, it's interesting how certain things remain conserved and beautifully the same. So here on the left-hand panel, you can see a rat brain. Uh, the front end is where the nose would be. The back end is where the tail is. So this is the olfactory bulb. This is a human brain. And of course, what's immediately obvious is that you can't, first of all, see our olfactory bulbs. They're buried deep underneath the cortex, which has now really exploded and become very, very large in human evolution. But I, what I want you to focus on is look at the parts of the brain that are dedicated to motor function, to touch, to vision. And what will become immediately apparent is yes, we have a much larger cortex, we have a much bigger brain, but look at the location and the positioning of the motor, the touch and the vision. And it's obvious that similar genetic blueprints have resulted in our brain being generated in much the same as the way in which the rat brain is ge generated. So this is invariant. You, me, everyone else will have the motor cortex in the same location. Our ability to percep perceive touch, which is a somatosensory cortex, will be right behind that. And this is invariant the manner in which this map is laid out and it's also conserved across evolution in mammalian evolution and this is remarkable because what this tells us that especially for developmental neurobiologists you can understand how the brain is built perhaps by trying to understand the genetic blueprint and the recipe in a sense that results in the generation of this very complex brain but that's not what i'm going to tell you about today so i like i said there is a fairly invariant genetic blueprint that results in these things being put, positioned in the right place. So all of us will have our visual cortex at the back. There's not going to be a single person suddenly whose visual cortex has moved to the front. Okay. I mean, a very invariant blueprint. And yet in the detail, we differ. Even though the broad blueprint is the same in the detail, we absolutely do differ. And this is where I, I would like to talk to what I would like to talk to you about today, which is that this blueprint is constantly instructed. And what instructs it? environment, experience, life, nutrition, so many factors that our brain is bathed with and um, sort of exposed to directly influence this blueprint to determine finally the fine tuning and the detail of how these circuits function. And in a sense, this results in this term that I would like to introduce to you, which is neuroplasticity. You might have already heard that people have told you the brain is a plastic structure. Well, obviously, it's not made of the same kind of plastic that our, you know, buckets, etc., are made of. But yes, why do we use the term? It's a plastic structure. It's a plastic structure because it is capable of responding to the environment, incorporating change, and modifying itself to that extent. And that's critical because hopefully, um, if you all listen to me over the next hour, some of the things that I will say will make sense. 
and that will get registered in your brain some of you will remember what i say and create new memories some of you may or may not get excited by this topic and in a sense this exposure this conversation is resulting in changes at the level of synapses within your brain so the brain is plastic and this property of neuroplasticity is one of the most unique things about the nervous system in that it's constantly reading the environment incorporating information and making functional change so experience causes the brain to change and that's what i mean by the term neuroplasticity now the next question we can then ask is is your brain capable of making change in the same level throughout the entire life right i mean are you going to so of course imagine you were 3 years old and you were listening to me you would not understand anything i'm saying because a lot of the jargon that i'm speaking would make no sense so obviously you would not register it if you were a student of perhaps uh hindi poetry then you might not look at me and listen to me and find this remotely interesting right you would say what is she saying but if you are hopefully a zoologist or a biologist something that i say might potentially trigger a thought and say hmm that's interesting i wonder what this means and those of you who are zoology students or since you have an expert there who works with ants you might start wondering about the social behavior of those complex organisms what do they do what a remarkable memory they might have to generate detailed information of their environments how do they incorporate this right so this is interesting and so it it is really that experience matters but all experiences don't have the same degree of effect and they don't have the same effect throughout life there are periods of time when your brain is most prone to making changes so let's say you and i decide to learn a new language all of us who are over 20 are going to struggle to learn the new language as well as say a 5 year old or a 4 year old Four year old will learn the language with a far greater ease than you and I will learn a new language and that's because that window of life is a critical period for language development in which the brain is most sensitive to incorporating information and actually acquiring so now i want to introduce you to the term of critical period plasticity i've already told you what plasticity is plasticity is the ability to make change so now i'm adding an adjective to this plasticity i'm calling it critical period plasticity what is a critical period it's a window of life in which your brain is particularly in fact way more sensitive to changes in the environment that's why it's called a critical period and you can think about critical periods as fundamental windows in which your brain which is already laid down with a genetic blueprint senses its environment adjusts its functional capability taking in information from the environment So for example let's take a bird a songbird which produces beautiful song but it needs a tutor to make that sound it needs to learn song now if you never have a tutor and no tutor ever sings to it it's going to produce a very fractured or it's not going to be able to be capable of producing beautiful song so this is and this is essential that it happens during the critical period in songbird development so we know this beautifully from diverse organisms that there are windows in which our brain is particularly sensitive to incorporating information so i'll re remind you again it's a time window during development when the brain is highly sensitive to environment and experience just to give you an idea this is from a review article what you can see here is that for example let's talk about binocular vision what do i mean by binocular vision our two eyes are facing forward we see a binocular world we have an area of the world which we process with both our eyes a lot of animals have monocular vision in their eyes are fa facing outwards and they see one different part of the world with this eye and a different part of the world with this eye now for us to have binocular vision and for binocular vision to develop effectively there's a critical period window in which if i shut one eye and this is profoundly important work that came from hubel wiesel which won them the nobel prize if i shut the eye during critical period then i will become functionally blind from that eye and that's because that i did not get the right visual experience nothing is wrong with my retina i can see so if you are processing signals at the level of the eye it's fine but my brain is no longer responding to the eye that was shut it said there's nothing important coming from this eye so i'm not going to waste any of my brain space on an eye that gives me no visual experience so you can see that there is there are windows for language you can see the window from language starting from one going on up to seven years this is for human beings now you can understand why there is a, such a serious problem that we start second language teaching in school too late so if you start teaching second languages and a lot of people worry if i expose my child to five languages or four languages 
will this become a problem will the development of any one language not happen well enough because they're speaking in too many languages well no actually um multilinguality seems to be actually a real asset for the brain this is a unique asset we have in india in that most of us speak two to three or four languages even if we don't speak five we understand multiple languages and that ability is actually an asset and a real it requires cognitive flexibility for a young child to flip from one language to the other and it's actually a really good training ground for the brain to be able to communicate in multiple languages we should not ever lose that advantage it really is an advantage but it's also important that when you want to teach second language you better start early there's no point at 50 say i'm going to go learn five new languages you might be able to pull it off but you will be an exception rather than the rule because the critical period has closed it is going to be that much harder for you to learn a language those of you who are bilingual should ask yourself this when you dream what language do you dream if you dream in more than one language that itself is kind of interesting it tells you something uh when you think in one language or you speak to a child and you pick up a child can you what is the instincting la instinctive language in which you communicate to the child and this becomes of interest because is your brain translating when you're switching from one language to the other or are you equally comfortable in both languages important question to ask for cognitive skills for social skills there are different critical period windows they're not exactly at the same time they're different parts of the brain and different parts of the brain may go through critical period windows at different times okay so now let me come to my topic my topic today was an early adversity and the programming of psychiatric vulnerability now any one of you even from old grandmother's tales or from conversations you have had with your own family you would know and you would know it also from anecdotal experience that the manner and the quality of your early environment will influence the way your brain functions and your adult behavior if you've been exposed to a extreme degree of stress in early environment then it does tend to influence adult behavior it's not predictive and deterministic but it's a risk factor it's absolutely a critical risk factor and so that's what i want to talk to you about today but we know this best in animal models and sensory systems i just gave you the example about the blocking of the eye if you block the eye during the critical period window you can actually become blind not because there's anything wrong with the eye but because the visual cortex has changed during this critical period when you shut the eye but it's much harder to understand for emotional neurocircuitry why is that like i said for vision the part on the panel on the left the blue part of the brain is that is the region that does the primary visual processing we know where to look when we modulate visual circuits where in the brain do you look when you think about emotion is there one precise circuit that you can pinpoint and say this is the circuit center in the brain that is regulating emotion if you ask any neurobiologist which is the circuit center in the brain that regulates laughter and joy they would struggle to tell you because it's difficult to pinpoint these circuits there are often more than one brain region they are multiple they are distributed and they talk to each other unlike that if you ask any of us what is the place in the brain where you process taste we're going to be able to find you a gustatory center it's it's much more easy to identify so this makes it that much more complex to study because it's distributed circuits and in the cartoon on the right hand side which is a section of the rat brain cut like this so you're looking from the side you can see that i have actually just little, written a lot of symbols like the prefrontal cortex which is pfc and the nucleus accumbens and you don't have to remember all these names what i want you to realize is unlike the visual primary visual cortex where i can show you one place in the brain i can't give you the same thing when you tell me where is sadness or depression process so where is fear and anxiety primary process where is disgust process we have some area so for example if you tell me fear i will tell you it's likely to be the amygdala the amygdala is one of the major centers that drives fear responses conserved across evolution but i also know that the amygdala is not a stand alone structure that just works by itself it talks to so many distributed circuits in the brain that it will be regulated by many many things and an example i can give you of that is let's say you're walking into your house and there's a plastic snake somebody has left the plastic snake on the ground first reaction if it's a good plastic snake will be oh my god here is a snake and you will have a response of fear a few seconds later your cortex will kick in and say oh no 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 this is just a joke someone's just played a game on me this is a plastic snake i don't need to freak out my cortisol does not need to be secreted my heart rate does not need to go up i can calm down that's because your prefrontal cortex is now shutting down that quick fear response that was driven through your amygdala 
So the reason I'm telling you this is these are distributed circuits. It's very difficult to pinpoint any one region. It talks to many, many circuits in the brain. Okay. What's the clinical evidence that indicates that psychiatric disorders have as one of their major risk factors early childhood adversity? So this was something that was done in a very large study. It's called the ACE study, which is Early Childhood Adverse Childhood Experience Study. It was done on 17,000 individuals in uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is a large managed healthcare in the US. And they simply followed people um, for a substantial uh, period of time. And they took detailed history of their early childhood experiences. So let me look at the left-hand panel and explain it to you. When it says zero, it means that there is no self-reporting of any adverse childhood experience. One means you can think of at least one major adverse event. It could be abuse, physical, sexual, emotional. It could be loss of a parent. It could be divorce. It could be nutritional deprivation. It could be an abusive environment because somebody's uh, you know, parent is, is a drug abuser. Variety of incidences. And if you say two or three or four plus, it's, it's the cumulative addition of more and more adverse factors. And what you can see that for both men and women, but certainly the data is stronger for women as far as depression is concerned. If you ask about substance abuse, it flips. There are more men at risk of substance abuse. There are more women at risk of, of um, depression. And this may also be both socially conditioned because certainly um, alcohol use and substance use is a more standard thing that men seek out. Uh, and that seems to be just a shift in the manner in which we sociologically being con um, conditioned. But what I want you to see, and the bottom line I want you to see is that the more the adverse early, early childhood experience, the greater you are at risk of a variety of psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, all of these disorders are in common, they have, one of the things they have in common is early adverse experience. Now, it's not a guarantee that just because you have had an early adverse experience, you will automatically get this, not at all. So please don't walk away with that understanding. I'm just saying that it is a risk factor. It's not a guarantee at all. There are amazing stories of individuals who have been remarkably resilient, handled adverse conditions and gone on to thrive. So there's no reason to believe that just because there's been an experience guaranteed there will be the emergence of psychiatric disorder. What it tells you is there is something in common across a variety of psychiatric disorders which arises as a consequence of risk from early adversity. And early adversity increases risk for social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk behavior, substance abuse. Absolutely, it's one of the major risk factors. So this is what I just wanted to tell you. Um, increased uh, risk for substance abuse, anxiety, and hallucinations as well. So we know this from studies in psychology and preclinical studies and clinical studies. We know this from evidence in humans. But how do we even begin to study this as neuroscientists? How am I going to actually study this in the brain and actually look within the brain and see what kind of changes take place? So for this, I need animal models. I need reliable animal models, and I'm not going to be able to produce an entire psychiatric disorder in any animal. It's not possible. Not even in a complex non-human primate will you get a full-fledged condition of schizophrenia or depression or anxiety. It's not possible. So what can we study? We can study aspects of the disease. We can study certain things that are common in these animals and us, where the circuits work in the same way, and they produce aspects of the behavioral changes. It cannot produce the entire disease. But why is this important? Because the drugs that work in animals also work in us. And ways in which to tweak these circuits also translates over to the human. So I'll tell you a little bit of the kind of models that people use. People use differences in maternal care. You can follow animals and actually profile their maternal care and look for differences. You can carry out perturbations in which these are species where it's only the mother that does the primary care. And so you can do maternal separation. There are other species in which the care is done by both the mother and the father, in which case you can also do paternal separation, where that also acts as a major um, you know, induction of early life stress. Okay, so let's come to this part. What we are going to now try to do is try to find a way to model this in an animal model so we can study it a little bit better and more deeply. So we want to tweak pre and postnatal experience. Then we want to ask what happens in the adult brain to circuits and behavior. 
And people other than me, I mean, lots of labs over the world study this. A fundamental question for lots of groups. Some of these um, experiments we also do in my lab. Some of these models we also use. So there are ways in which you can give a drug to a pup and change the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. And I'll tell you about some of that. You can look at naturally occurring variation in the quality of care that a dam gives to her pup. And based on that study, what are the consequences to the pup? You can take the pups away from the mother for short durations, which actually are not uh, nutritionally or really depri depriving to the animal. But because you're taking it away in a laboratory situation, the quality of care that the mother gives actually deteriorates. And that becomes a model of maternal neglect, where the mother actually neglects her pups and doesn't do a very active grooming and nurture. Or you can do the opposite, which is you can make the environment you can see what about the benefits of changing the environment, making it far more positive. So you can create complex social environments with enriched toys and a variety of things that actually increase the complexity in the environment. And people have done all of this and found changes in anxiety, depressive-like behavior, which you can measure in rodents, stress responses, both hormonal stress responses and brain activation, cognition, because these animals can be studied for their ability to learn and remember. Their social interactions with members of their, you know, conspecifics, uh, dendritic morphology, architecture of neurons, the formation of new neurons in the brain, how the brain ages. People have looked at all of this. Okay. And I'm going to give you some evidence from my own lab that will just give you a sense of the kind of experiments we do in my lab. So we are, of course, interested in how pre and postnatal experience will shape these circuits in the brain such that these circuits now will drive a change in both the manner in which these circuits function and eventually the resultant behavior that they produce. And you can do this by looking at how it influences neurotransmission and neurocircuitry. And you can also ask, are there epigenetic marks that arise as a consequence of this experience such that genes either within the promoter region or even within intragenic regions where the histones get modified or the DNA gets modified either with a methylation mark or an acetylation mark, such that levels of proteins are modulated and permanently altered within the nervous system. So you can study it at these two levels and I'll give you a sense of a little bit of uh, the sort of things that we are doing. Okay. So quick summary of the kind of work we've done and then I'll tell you one particular story. I can't uh, share most of it, but I'll tell you one story. So we work with a very old model, maternal separation model, which was set up by Seymour Levine from University of Colorado in Boulder in the, in the 1960s. So it's an old model that's been used by psychologists for a long time and now is also one that is routinely used by neuroscientists. This model involves taking the pups away every day for three hours from postnatal day two to postnatal day 14, which is two days after they're born till 14 days after their birth in this critical period window. And it only works if you do it in this window. You do it in the third week, you don't get any effects. Okay, so it has to be done in this critical period window. You take the entire cohort away. These pups go away as a cohort. They stay away for three hours from their mother. That's it. Now, this is a very naturalistic paradigm because normally in the wild, the dam would actually go to find food for three hours. It'd not be surprising at all for her to leave her, leave her litter for as long as three hours. But what happens is that in the laboratory situation, she's not choosing to leave. She's being taken away. And when she's given back and the litter is given back to her, she actually nurses them. So they're not nutritionally deprived at all. So they don't really, their thermoregulation is maintained, food is given but she doesn't do active nurture, which is lifting them up, sitting on top of them and constantly licking and grooming them. That part starts to deteriorate. And that deterioration sets up lifelong behavioral changes in these animals, setting up a very different stress response pathway, increasing their baseline anxiety, causing metabolic changes right from the muscle to the liver to the brain, uh, changing their serotonin pathway, which is what I'm going to tell you about today and causing epigenetic marks at multiple genes, including trophic factor genes that are maintained across the lifespan. In fact, one of the things we've done, we've looked at changes 15 months after this transient perturbation in early life. And we can still see epigenetic marks that result from this transient early life adverse event. And that tells you that there are very often very long lasting consequences. What is also interesting is some of these can be erased. By what you do later, and then environment that you expose these animals to later can actually erase some of these marks and can reverse some of these changes. Another way in which we can model this is in a model that was set up by Mark and Sorge and others, which we routinely use in our lab also, 
what we do is we elevate the levels of serotonin in the brain. Uh, and we can do this by using a drug called fluoxetine, which will increase the amount of serotonin at the synapse by uh, preventing its reuptake. And what we find is that when we do this, we get changes in common with the maternal separation paradigm. In part, not completely, but in part, there are things that are reproduced. The adverse events are reproduced if you can mimic it by simply elevating levels of serotonin. And so that's something that I wanted to tell you about. So today I have one story to tell, which is to ask, okay, if the serotonin pathway is altered, how is it altered? Where is it altered? And can we understand something about it? Remember, I told you about the prefrontal cortex a few minutes ago. I told you about how it's one of those cortical circuits that has top-down control over many things. I started by telling you about fear, using the example of that plastic snake, saying that that's the circuit that will tell you, no, 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 that's just a plastic snake. Don't be scared, right? So the prefrontal cortex has top-down control over the hypothalamus, over the amygdala, over the nucleus accumbens, over the raphe. It's a hub region that processes information and can talk to these subcortical regions in a sense, allowing you to control and modulate stress. Let me give you an example. Let's say tomorrow there, everybody decides to go bungee jumping. Okay, what will they do? You will have to tie a rope around your ankles and jump off something. Many of you may find it entertaining and wonderful and say, oh, what a phenomenal experience it was. And some people will say, this is the most horrible thing you can do to us because you have tied a rope and told us to jump off something and then suspended us from this rope, right? The reason I'm giving you this example is your stress and my stress may not be the same. And your ability to control and switch off the stress is going to be different from mine. And the ability to control these responses comes from the cortex. While the bottom-down circuitry tends to be very quick and rapid, our ability to process and control these circuits come from higher cortical regions. Okay. All right. So work done by Madhu and Ankit and Stita and Amrita in my lab what they set out to ask was, does by any chance maternal separation change the function of one of the major receptors for serotonin, which is the serotonin 2 receptor, the 5-HT2 receptor? I'm going to ignore the other receptors for now and keep the story simple with only one receptor, but, but keep in mind there are 14 receptors for serotonin, okay? All of them are expressed in the cortex, most of them at least, and 5-HT2 is very abundant in the cortex. It's also a critically important, clinically relevant receptor. So Madhu and Stita and Ankit and Amrita decided to ask, okay, when we maternally separate animals, is the function of this particular receptor different? And this is a GPCR. It's a G protein coupled receptor that couples to the GQ protein which signals via phospholipase C cascade to increase the excitation of neurons and also to produce calcium. So that comes back to the idea of GQ signaling or GPCR signaling. Okay, so let's simplify this. So what did they do? What they wanted to do was ask, is a behavioral response that is evoked by a drug that activates the serotonin 2 receptor different based on what your life history was? So let's say I have a rat who has a normal history, was with its mother, completely normal care. And I have another rat who has gone through this separation paradigm. And now, I, obviously, I don't have just one one. I have large cohorts, okay? I have many behaviors. Behavioral studies are always done on multiple animals from multiple cohorts. So let's say you, you study this. And now you say, I'm going to come in with a receptor stimulating drug. In this case, a drug called DOI. This drug is a targets this receptor. And when it binds to this receptor, it produces a very canonical behavior, which is a head twitch behavior. The head actually shakes. And the best way to de describe it is all of you would have seen this. If a dog is dipped in water, what happens when it comes out? You know the way in which it shakes to get rid of the water from its head. It's a very characteristic response. That actual head shake behavior is driven through this particular receptor. And so it's actually called a wet dog shake and a head, uh, head shake behavior. If you don't have this receptor, this response does not occur. So it's driven through this receptor. So what Madhu and others found was that when you take animals, and here I'll walk you through this panel, this is data from postnatal day 21. So they're only three weeks old. This is when they're three months old. So you're asking how does this behavior change at two time points when these animals have gone through maternal separation? And you measure the number of head twitches that the animal makes. So even the control animal makes a few head twitches. But when you give the control animal the drug that stimulates the 5-HT2 receptor, you get this big increase in head twitches as expected. What I want you to see is these are the maternally separated animals. In maternally separated animals, both at postnatal day 21 and postnatal day 90, you get an 
exaggerated response. For the same amount of drug, you get a stronger response, which tells us that either you have more receptor or you have more coupling of the receptor. To cut the story short, I tell you that they don't have any more receptor. The receptor is exactly the same. Okay, they don't have any change in receptor mRNA, receptor protein, receptor binding. Everything is the same. And yet the function is more. Somehow, because you've gone through this early adversity, your receptors are 5-HE2 receptors, even though you have the same number of receptors, are functioning in a heightened manner. We can show this electrophysiologically, which we did in collaboration with Evelyn Lam. You can take slices from the brain put them in a bath dish, apply the drug and measure the electrophysiological response of neurons in response to, response to stimulating the receptor. And what's the bottom line? Here is the invert current. This is the excitatory current, which is produced in controls neurons and in neurons from animals and slices that are derived from animals that have gone through maternal separation. And what you can see is that the invert current is way more if you've gone through maternal separation which means that the neurons are now for the same dose of the drug, giving you much more of a firing-like response because they let in way more invert current. And this is interesting. Why is this happening, right? You have the same amount of receptor, you have same amount of binding, same amount of mRNA and same amount of protein, and yet you have way more function. So one of the things that Ankit Sita showed is that you actually have more GQ, which is the G protein that binds to this receptor. And the downstream enzymatic cascade and you can look at protein kinase phospholipase a whole bunch of other downstream factors they get upregulated okay and um, for example i can show you in this panel on the right hand side this is the calmodulin kinase camk one g in the bottom most right panel you can see that if you've gone through early stress or maternal separation you end up with significantly more expression of the entire enzymatic cascade so now what i've told you is that you go through maternal separation. That somehow perturbs the drive through this 5-HT2 receptor. This results in more circuit activity. We so show this electrophysiologically. Global gene expression changes, which I just touched upon, but we looked at the whole genome by doing an array to look at the entire genome. And it's very obvious that GPCR signaling is disrupted. And of course, the behavioral responses go haywire, right? Why? Don't know. Okay, so this is working. Why is this happening? I mean, you have the same amount of receptor. Is it that it's desensitizing differently? Is it that the coupling is different? Is there heterocomplexes that are different? Is the pairing with the enzymes? If you don't know, still have to find out, still working on it. Not an easy problem to solve because it's this is an effect that is seen in about 40 to 50 percent of the neurons, not all neurons, but it's enough to drive a change in behavior. And it's difficult to do biochemistry in the brain when only a subset of neurons shows this effect. If it was a whole cortex, it would make it so easy, but it doesn't work like that, okay? It's one, some fraction of neurons have started functioning differently. So we've been trying to tackle it in many, many different ways. I haven't solved it yet, but we're working at it. Okay, I wanna show you another example of why this matters, okay? So Madhu then said, okay, I'm gonna actually try this interesting experiment where, okay, I don't have this particular video, but I'm gonna show you this experiment that she did. So she said, is this even important? Okay, we just stumbled on something. The serotonin 2 receptor is giving you this extra driven function. Does it matter really for the behavior of the animals? So what she decided to do is while they were babies and they were taken away from the mother, she fed them a blocker of that receptor. So maternally separated animals, there would be a normal cohort. There would be a cohort that went through maternal separation. There would be a cohort that was simply fed the blocker of this receptor. And a cohort that went through both maternal separation and blockade of the receptor. So you have four groups. And here's what she finds. And this is a busy slide, but I'm going to walk you through it. Stay with me while I walk you through the top panel, okay? Here you're looking at the prefrontal cortex of animals. They've all been given vehicle, which means they've been given no drug, okay? These are controlled prefrontal cortices. Here's an example from one brain, but we would have looked at about 10 to 12 animals from each cohort, okay? So there'll be 10 to 12 controls, 10 to 12 maternal separations. That's the kind of N. And then you repeat this whole experiment at least two to three times. So what you see here is these are control animals. These are maternally separated animals. And you are looking at gene expression of an activity associated gene. So the intensity, the darkness tells you if that part of the brain is actively firing or not, because this is an activity dependent gene. What you see is maternally separated animals look just like control. 
now when you expose animals to a stress in adulthood every single day they see a stress the first time they see the stress the cortex gets activated second time still activated but after 10 days of seeing the same stress the animal doesn't really care it desensitizes it's like acha theek hai it's like traveling in the mumbai local if you never travel in the mumbai local first time you get in the train you're going to be jam packed and you're going to be stressed because you don't know how to handle it but if every day you're traveling in the mumbai local is not going to be stressful for you it becomes just what you do you don't even think about it you jump into a moving train which is crowded without even worrying about it. so much like that these vertebrate counterparts these mammals rodents also desensitize to stress beautifully so you can see that if you've seen the same stress every day for 10 days nothing happens but look what happened if you had a history of maternal separation if when you were a baby this pup was a baby it went through early stress then when it becomes an adult and it sees chronic stress it behaves as though it's seeing the stress for the very first time it cannot desensitize and that's a really fundamental observation because it tells us that just having a history of early trauma changes how you process stressors in adulthood you don't actually desensitize at all you treat it like oh my god again a new stress again it's the same stress but you're seeing it every day and you're not able to treat it as okay i don't have to worry about this you just keep responding to it the brain responds you also hormonally respond that's a separate uh, piece of data i'm not telling you about that now see what happens when you block the receptor when these guys are babies so here is the data from giving these animals ketanserin when they were pups okay so you have fed ketanserin to this entire cohort doesn't do anything to the control so it looks just like vehicle fed maternally separated animals baseline look just the same control chronic stress in adulthood looks the same but now look at this maternally separated animals that went through adversity but you block the 5ht2 receptor during that early window and wait it till they became adults and now given that the chronic stress they go back to behaving just like regular animals which tells us that the blockade of the 5ht2 receptor matters and madhu extended this much further to show that when you block the receptor anxiety like behavior on the elevated plus means here's the anxiety like behavior we can measure we measure it by the ethological behavior these animals show in task where we look at whether they enter the center do they enter open arms how do they behave in these tasks which is done with an infrared camera we step out the animals are allowed to behave we record their behavior and then we actually analyze it and when you do that you can clearly see that these animals that go through maternal separation obviously show anxiety like behavior in adulthood but if you block the 5ht2 receptor during maternal separation wait 3 months and then do the behavior you prevent the anxiety caused by maternal separation so what have i shown you so far i'm going to skip this part i'm going to quickly go through this how, how am i doing for time how much time do i have left i'm not able to hear you sorry i wasn't able to hear you just to get a sense of hello yeah yeah we can get carry no issue okay great There's okay no so, constraint of time okay terrific so then i'll carry on and hopefully my audience is still with me so what i've shown you so far is i've told you that maternal separation produces at least one change that we have found which is this changed function of the 5ht2 receptor i told you about the prefrontal cortex i should tell you that this function is changed in all cortical areas okay when we looked at other cortical areas we found it's not just the prefrontal cortex the somatosensory cortex also changed shows this change in function so it's a broad cortical change something seems to happen to the function of these receptors that is now changed across the lifespan of the animal if you block this receptor you prevent the anxiety and you prevent certain stress like behavioral responses in these animals so now ambalika and parul two other graduate students in the in the lab and parul is actually one of my students that came to me from punjab university interestingly she came to me to do my phd from punjab university so if you look at uh, look at what happens in these animals it's quite interesting um in these animals that's the pnflx model here there's no separation no trauma nothing done to them you simply elevate levels of serotonin in the brain if you le elevate levels of serotonin serotonin in the brain you will also produce anxiety but you have to do it in this early window you do it later you won't get the effects it has to be done in that p2 to p20 window that's the critical period in the first 2 3 weeks of life you elevate levels of serotonin you get anxiety so what parul and ambalika decided to ask was okay if this really matters can we not go and block so we'll raise the levels of serotonin but we won't allow it to work on the 5ht2 receptor and if we don't allow it to work on the 5ht2 receptor will we still get anxiety i'll walk you through this data 
on panel b so there are four groups there's a control group in which nothing was given just vehicle was fed and the animals are allowed to grow up there's a group that was given the blocker for the 5-HT2 receptor which is called ketanserin if you block the receptor so this group is just given the blocker and nothing else is done to it then there's a group which is the PNFLX group in which we elevate levels of serotonin by giving fluoxetine so there's a cohort that receives fluoxetine and then they are left out into adulthood and then there is a go cohort in which we give both drugs first we block the receptor and then we elevate levels of serotonin and now we look in adult and we're running these behaviors on a variety of battery of tasks but here i'm showing you two behavioral tasks one is the open field maze is a very easy test it's basically a square box and um, the animals are put into this box and you any of you who have seen a rat how often do you see a rat running in the middle of the road or in the middle of the room you see that it runs on the corners right it's a it's a behavior that's called a thigmotactic behavior in which it sticks to one wall and runs along the walls it doesn't run into the middle of the room especially not into a room where it doesn't know what's going on and that's a pure survival instinct you tend to spend time on the periphery in a place which is new to you just to reduce your risk and animals that are given drugs that actually treat anxiety will happily go into the middle okay animals that have high degree of stress or have gone through stress don't enter the middle they spend time on the periphery and you can actually see it here here's control animals this is a trace from one particular so we can trace these maps and we can actually look at their speed we can look at how often they spend time in one place how much time they when do they go what everything like we can actually track their entire behavior here is a control animal fed vehicle you can see that it spends most of its time in the periphery but every now and then it goes to the center here are here is an example of an animal that has had an elevation of serotonin when it was a baby and then you let it become an adult and study its behavior and it has high anxiety in that it tends to go far less to the center it spends less time in the center it enters the center less all of that is altered and so you can see that that produces a behavior that is called an anxiety like behavior now you take the same cohort of animals and you block the 5-HT2 receptor when they are babies and then you look at their behavior when they are adults so there are no drugs on board when you're studying the behavior because that's three months later and what you see is you block all the anxiety like behavior and that tells you that when you elevate serotonin you have to allow it to work on the 5-HT2 receptor to produce the anxiety if you don't allow it to work on the this gq coupled receptor it will not produce anxiety at all it's also true with the elevated plus maze the elevated plus maze is a maze which is like an x well not exactly like an x but like a cross and what you have are two open arms which are two feet elevated off the floor but they don't have any walls so it's kind of like walking on a plank which is elevated so animals don't like to enter the open arms they much prefer to spend time in the closed arms and we can track their behavior and here is a the here are the closed arms here are the open arms you can see that this vehicle animal went into both closed and open but when they've been fed serotonin in early life they tend to spend time only in the closed arms and they barely go into the open arms and obviously we study this across large cohorts and so this anxiety like behavior is reversed when you block the 5-HT2 receptor so that's what Ambalika and uh, Parul were able to show. Here's my two graduate students, very talented, and now they're off doing their postdocs and studying elsewhere in the world. But both of these students went on to show that just like with maternal separation, if you block the 5-HT2 receptor, you do not produce anxiety. I've shown you one behavior. You also don't produce despair. You also change cortical excitation and you change other stress hormonal responses, data which I've not shown you. But I'm showing you one example of what we can block. By the way, you don't block everything. Huh? There are things that you don't block. So it's not like every single thing gets blocked, but multiple components do get blocked. And that's interesting because it's never one pathway and it's never one thing. It's always going to be effects on multiple systems and you can block one thing, but the other thing still goes on. So then Parul and Ambalika said, okay, if this is true, then we should simply be able to stimulate the 5-HT2 receptor. We'll do nothing else to the animals. We'll go in when they are babies and we'll stimulate the 5-HT2 receptor. And it should be enough to produce anxiety because if that's so important, we should be able to drive the behavior. That's exactly what they did. They went in with a drug DOI which stimulates this receptor, fed it to the babies, left the animals alone for three months and then went in and studied behavior. And when they did that, they produced anxiety-like behavior on multiple different paradigms. So what have I shown you so far? Let me summarize. Maternal separation produce anxiety-like behavior in adulthood. Elevating serotonin also produces anxiety. It also produces depression-like behavior. 
both of these are blocked if you block this gq coupled receptor you block the 5ht2a receptor and none of this happens in adult if you go in and stimulate the receptor don't do anything else to the animal just feed it a drug that stimulates the receptor you will actually produce enhanced anxiety and despair like behavior now that tells us that this receptor which is a g protein coupled receptor in the cortex is central however there's a problem with some of this right all the data i've shown you is systemic we are feeding the drug where orally where are the receptors everywhere in the body why do i think it's working on the cortex it can be working anywhere else i don't have any evidence to support that none of our data supports that so far it tells us the receptor is important it just doesn't tell us where we don't know which receptor we think it's cortex because we've actually measured cortical activity all of that but it could be something else and we don't have any evidence to support that so how do we actually tease that apart how do we actually study that and this is what sita and the lab along with prachi and sonali and others went on to study and what sita did is said i want to test this but in a cleaner way i want to see if gq signaling which is the gpcr that this 5h2a receptor is coupled to gq signaling there are many other things that are coupled to gq signaling but the 2a receptor is absolutely coupled to gq signaling and i'm summarizing about a decade of work by then it was obvious to us that we were not the only ones who were beginning to find this people found this with maternal immune activation so paper came out with a very different paradigm completely different model in which there is trauma created by prenatally exposing these animals to elevated cytokines by infecting the mother and when you do that you get schizophrenia and anxiety and despair like behavior you also increase 5ht2a function so we're very happy to see that because we are like okay it's not just a model we are studying some other models somewhere else in the world other people have found the same thing very nice to know because you need to know that your work is corroborated by others and so um, then we started wondering maybe this is common and then a collaborator of ours said by the way guys i told you that 5ht2a receptor function is up but guess what when i look at muscarinic m1 receptor function which is gq coupled that is also up so then we began to wonder maybe it's not just the 5ht2a receptor maybe it's broad maybe it's everything that is coupled to gq signaling remember i told you that 5ht2a receptor levels didn't change but function changed maybe what you've done is ramp up the gain on the entire gq pathway downstream and that's why you're getting this effect so sita said let's ask that let's ask that directly and in a cleaner manner suppose we go in and we had a tool that allows us to increase gq signaling in the cortex can we actually produce increase vulnerability increase anxiety increase depressive how will we do this right so 20 years ago we could not have done this the only way we would have done it is systemically but now the tools in neuroscience are so powerful and so amazing that we can actually go ahead and do this and for this we took advantage of a genetic biogenic strategy using a tool that has been created by brian roth's lab now i have to explain this to you because it's a beautiful tool you may have heard about optogenetics what i'm going to tell you about is a tool called chemogenetics in this we use genetically engineered mice in which we drive a mutant receptor okay so the receptor is called a dread and now you'll ask me why is it called a dread it's called a designer receptor exclusively activated by a designer drug and that's why it's dread that's the acronym okay it's a mutated receptor it's not present in the rat brain naturally it's a it's actually a human receptor that's been mutated modified etc and it's been it's a gq coupled receptor it couples to gq and the way in which they've modified it and mutated it it binds to a drug that you choose which is called clozapine nitric oxide now clozapine nitric oxide will not bind to anything else it will bind to this mutant receptor and when it binds to this mutant receptor it will increase gq signaling via the phospholipase c path so now we have a tool which allows us to sort of increase gq signaling the only way we can use this is if we get it into the part of the brain that we want at the time we want correct so how do we do this we have to now make a mouse which will express this mutant receptor only in the cortical neurons that we want at the time we want so we have a biogenic mouse in which this gq receptor is expressed under the control of a promoter called camk2 which is made only by excitatory neurons of the cortex so we have be, and you can see the expression on the left hand side you can see that there's a population of neurons that are starting to express this receptor so we can drive the receptor and we can drive it only there so now when we feed the animal cno it will stimulate this receptor 
in the neurons we want at the time we want. Okay, so it's a way we can control this. That's exactly what Stitha decided to ask. Okay, this receptor is important. I mean, if GQ signaling is important, let us get GQ signaling driven in the cortex. On the left-hand side, you can see a sagittal panel of the rat brain. In this case, it's a mouse brain. What you can see is cortex and hippocampus. And we've driven expression in this region, okay? And instead of the 5-HT2A receptor, we are now using a proxy way of switching on GQ signaling by using this mutated receptor. And then we say, okay, we've got it in the right place and we've tested this in multiple ways. And then now we switch it on by feeding these animals CNO, which will of course go everywhere, but the receptor is only expressed in this part of the brain. So we will switch on signaling only in that part of the brain. That's exactly what Stitha did. He switched on signaling within the cortex in this window. And so here's the working hypothesis. We are now switching on signaling in cortical areas through this mutated receptor. And we are asking, what does it do to behavior? What does it do to molecular changes? What does it do to architecture? What does it do? Basically, if we ectopically switch on GQ signaling in this circuit, what will happen to these animals? And so Stitha did this extensively. First of all, he made sure that when you do this, the normal development is not disrupted, and it's not. These animals develop normally. They develop normal reflexes. They surface write. So I'll give you an example of one thing. Surface writing, which means that if you turn the animal upside down, during development, the animal learns to come straight. And you would have seen this. If you have a small cat, or a little puppy and you turn it around, it will turn over by itself, right? Unlike human babies who can't turn over for months. So this is a developmental event which happens in rodents fairly quickly. By postnatal day 12, they are all turning over very quickly. And the amount of time it takes, you can actually measure the amount of time it takes for them. You turn them back on their back and you ask how long does it take for them to become sida. And that you can measure and you can see that the normal development of reflexes all goes on normally when you're going after this. We had to check this because when we're giving the drug, we're stimulating GQ signaling all over the cortex. Are we messing up what you call standard reflex development? We're not. Reflex development is happening absolutely normal. But look what happens when we do this from postnatal day 2 to 14. Then we switch on this recept switch off the receptor and don't give the drug ever again. So we have only transiently allowed the receptor to be expressed and transiently stimulated GQ signaling. And we're asking this three months later and we look at behavior. And what do we start seeing? Increased anxiety-like behavior. Very clear pattern of in increased anxiety. We see this in multiple different paradigms. Here's another paradigm called the light dark box in which the uh, animal in adulthood is now put in the dark chamber. And you ask how many times does it go to the light area? The light area is the anxiety provoking area. It's the, well, it's a scarier area for the animal. The animal prefers to spend time in the dark dabba. And what you can see is that the number of entries, the time spent in the light box goes down. These animals exhibit anxiety like behavior. When you look at struggling behavior, which is a form of despair like behavior, how quickly do they give up in a paradigm in which there isn't escape? You can look at swimming, you can look at uh, struggling behavior, time spent immobile is how quickly do they give up? Do they just go to floating? And you can see that this kind of despair-like behavior has also changed. So we ran them on a battery of behaviors here. Again, uh, open field behavior using a different drug, not CNO, but also a drug that stimulates this mutant receptor, A21. We have to make sure that the drug is not having some random other effect. So we tested it with another drug and we can clearly see anxiety. Now, this was really, really interesting. Is what we now have done is that these animals have no change in their environment. All we have done is driven GQ signaling in excitatory neurons of the cortex and the forebrain. And by driving it in this window from P2 to P14, we can reproduce, enhance anxiety, enhance depression-like behavior, enhance schizophrenia-like behavior, altered sensory motor gating, altered stress responses seen months after the short term perturbation and we know it has to be done in this window because if we do this later we don't get any of these effects when we do it when these animals are adolescents we don't get the effect when we do the effects of the behavior the paradigms in adulthood we don't see the effect so there's a critical period and there is a circuit and we're beginning to narrow it down we still don't know why and how this happens but we know the circuit now and we know the timing that matters um so i'm going to wrap up by summarizing what we've shown I've shown you older data from our lab where we looked at a paradigm of maternal separation and produce anxiety-like behavior and showed a central role for the 5-HT2A receptor. I've then shown you data where you elevate serotonin and reproduce these kind of behavioral paradigms. Again, a paradigm for which you need the 5-HT2A receptor to be central to drive these responses. 
I've shown that the 5-HT2A receptor is very important by showing you work from very talented graduate students and postdocs who showed that if you stimulate this receptor, you can reproduce the changes in behavior that you see in adulthood. And most recently, I've shown you work from Sita, Prachi, and Sonali, which shows that when you go in with a far more genetic strategy to simply modulate GQ signaling, you can reproduce these kinds of states in adulthood. So what's our working hypothesis? We have perturbed it in one circuit. I just want to give you a, you know, sometimes the problem with all of this is it sounds so clear and sounds so simple and sounds so, I just want to show you the complexity. So when you look at even a micro circuit in the cortex, look at the number of neurons. Here's a big principal neuron in which we have modulated and genetically driven this receptor. But there are so many other neurons. There's a paravalvimin positive neuron. There are these 5-HT3 expressing basket cell neurons. There's a somatosensory expressing inhibitory neuron. We are now tweaking it in different, different parts of these circuits because we really don't know. We've only done it in one major kind of neuron in the brain. And we know that if you drive excitation in this neuron, in that window from postnatal day to 14, you will produce all of these behavioral changes. But we don't know why. We think it's because we've perturbed excitation inhibition balance. We've changed the metabolic activity in these neurons. We have a lot of NMR data and electrophysiology data with our collaborators that suggest that, but we really don't know yet exactly why. I'd like to wrap up by showing you my lab. Very lucky to work with some immensely dedicated, talented, wonderful young people who keep um, the lab going and keep the excitement high in the lab. Uh, the two central questions we work on are how does life experience talk to neural circuits to shape emotional behavior? And then we like to ask and dissect out those neural circuits and the molecular pathways that actually mediate such behavioral changes. And finally, we like to ask, how do drugs that treat patients actually interact with these pathways to bring about changes? So that's the work we do. Um, I'd like to end with this quote. Uh, it's a, one of my favorite quotes of T.S. Eliot, where he says, in my beginning is my end. And the reason I want to tell you this is that there are critical periods and windows in early life where if we focus our public health resources and looked after people in that window, we may not be facing the kind of burden that they face in adulthood. So that first 10 years of life is so critical in shaping risk for so many psychiatric disorders that if you get it right, then you, a, a, a little bit of prevention is worth all the cure because none of the cure is that effective. And so I want to share that. My collaborators, James Chalaya, JNCSR, with whom we is very generously opened his lab to us. And my students went there and did electrophysiology, which he supervised. And so he's our close collaborator on the GQ st study. Anand Patel at CCMB, where my student again went there and did the NMR work to look at metabolic activity. Uh, it's fantastic when one can set up collaborations because none of this can be done by just a few people or even by just my lab. We need the support of others. And so I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and of course TIFR for the funding and DAE for the support. My lab is actually not in this photograph. And I want to show you where my lab would be. My lab is one little hut. It literally is a hut. It's a barracks-like old structure, which has a, um, there are that patral roof, the roof, which is an aluminum roof. So it is a little hut on the side of the sea, the fantastic location, but it is a hut. And so I often tell my lab, see, we're doing slum science. There's no reason why even in a hut with a patra, you can't dream big and you can't try to do whatever, but you need people to help you and you need collaborators and you need great students who are excited by what they do. And so hopefully somewhere in this audience today is someone else at Patiala University who says, hey, maybe I'd like to go work with Vidita. So that's my pitch to say, please do apply to us. Come consider working with us for your master's, for your PhD, for your postdoc. We're always excited to accept talented students. That's what drives a lab eventually at the end of the day. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure to talk to all of you today and for your patience and listening to me. I'm not able to, I mean, is it muted? I'm not, am I no, the only uh, one who can't hear? still I can't hear. muted. Let me tell.
Yeah, Let I me can't ask him to anything. unmute. I can't hear. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, it's okay. Now. <laughs> okay. So uh, there are a number of questions. I'll uh, try to combine those questions if they are similar from different students. So number one is, uh, can we use the features of neuroplasticity to transform our minds? Yeah, I mean, I will just give you the catchphrase that every neurobiologist uses. I don't know who actually came up with it, but use it or lose it is a very good catchphrase, <laughs> which is like, um, I mean, if you do not use certain parts of your nervous system and neurocircuits, they they fall into disuse. But how do you do that? So, you know, our brain is great at becoming, picking up habits. So if you don't challenge yourself with learning something new and something different, then you don't push the system. So that you can keep, so for example, let's good example is riding the bicycle. The first time you rode the bicycle, it was a genuine challenge. You probably fell down. It was not easy. You could not coordinate your motor activity. But once you learned it, you never think, oh, Okay, now I have to climb up, then I have to move my right leg. You just do it automatically. That's a good example because many, many times things become routine and rote and automatic and we just do them. And then the brain is not being taxed. The brain is doing them almost like a background level activity. So to actually use it, you have to push yourself, which is to do something different from what you're used to doing. You know, to, to really use plasticity, you have to actually, that's why learning a musical instrument or why it's so hard. I mean, today, if you pick up the violin and say, I will learn the violin, it's not easy to do. It's because that's a genuine challenge. You're really pushing it. So pushing the envelope is necessary to really drive plasticity. And so, yeah, you can't get away with doing uh, something that's too easy. Uh, our student, Upaninthar, is very curious. She has put forward a number of questions. Uh, she's asking whether nurturing from a caring mother alter the epigenome? Yes, so you are now talking about beautiful work that comes from uh, Michael Meany and Moshe Sif at McGill, where they've looked at nurture and how nurture actually leaves epigenetic marks. Now, I want to be careful and remind you that when we deal with species like rodents, especially these rodents, it's not a biparental system. And so that's why it becomes the mother. The minute you move to primate, it's much more complex. It becomes pure nurture. It's communities that nurture. Then there's a grandmother and a grandfather and an uncle and an aunt. Much more complex in primate societies than it is in these kinds of rodents. But yes, nurture is fundamental in terms of leaving marks at the level of the epigenome. In fact, very elegant work from Moshe Sif and Michael Meany shows that the manner in which you will nurture, especially for these rodent species, is dependent in the way you were nurtured. And so there are epigenetic marks that form at the oxytocin receptor based on the quality of nurture you receive that will determine the kind of nurture you give when you become an adult. And this is non-genomic. It is transmitted purely by environment in that when, they, when you cross foster and adopt, adoption clearly shows that this is not a genetically transmitted um, a piece of information. This is a genomic, not a gen genomic inheritance, an epigenome inheritance, which is environment talking to the genome and then educating the genome to determine these kind of behaviors in adulthood. So yes, I uh, would strongly recommend reading uh, review articles by Michael Meany and others that have beautifully, th their work is really elegant in this area. Another question from her is that uh... How does toxic stress turn on or off certain genes, triggering various mental and physical health outcomes? So, um, I mean, one thing is that, that we have a very beautiful stress response pathway. We all will switch on the secretion of cortisol the minute we go through stress. I mean, it could be something as minor as doing a mental math uh, task. You know, suppose I tell you now calculate this much into this much is how much, and you have to do it with, with a stop clock. That also in induces a min minor stress, but you will get a small cortisol peak and it will go away. And cortisol is a beautiful hormone. It was designed to allow you to survive, okay? So imagine that this system was beautifully designed when we were out in the wilderness. So, so let's say you are out and you, you, know, you are a you're hunter-gatherer societies. You can imagine from that point of view, beautiful system. Let's say you have to run away from something because it's going to eat you up. But you need cortisol because you need to mobilize glucose to your muscles. You need to shut down digestion. You need to control and modify the way your immune system functions. 
beautiful system for quick rapid usage so it's designed for acute short stress but it's not designed for chronic stress not the kind of stress that we go through i mean certainly not designed for things like oh you know on social media somebody was not nice to me today and then you worry about it and then you have no control over it and it really doesn't matter actually when you think about it but it matters to your psyche and you worry about it and say somebody was not really nice to me or my you know somebody was mean or somebody is going to deprive me of something or jealousy envy greed things that drive stress responses but you sometimes have no control over those circumstances and same pathway is switched on that was switched on you know it has been switched on evolutionarily so that pathway is a gorgeous pathway for rapid quick switch on and switch off a stress response but it's not a great pathway for chronic sustained stress where you don't have control over switching off the stress response yeah uh, another question is uh, can we use uh, behavioral measurements in young children to assess their vulnerability to excessive stress in future yes people have and people have looked at behavioral i mean there's a lot of clinical psychology data so what neuroscience is doing is inspired by clinical psychology data there's a breadth of data that has been done in children in adolescents in young children there's there's i mean several decades of work on this where people have looked at this and have looked at behavioral reactivity in young children as a predictor of their adult behavioral states and uh, there's elegant work that's been done and now it's been done with uh, you know with the hope to eventually use functional magnetic resonance imaging to start looking at the circuits in the brain and so you 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 look at the behaviors and then you use it as a predictor of how the brain changes of course you don't get the resolution of the detail that you get in rodent studies but you get far more relevance because it's a direct study that is done with a clinical cohort so yes absolutely um, lots of people do this and very elegant work from many groups across the world this question may be beyond neuroscience the student is asking does intuitions have any correlation with neuroplasticity ha huh. so these are i mean you know now you're asking me the the hard questions of neuroscience where is in, where is intuition placed i told you we won't even be able to answer where is laughter and joy produced which is itself and we know we all feel joy and we know we laugh but i can't tell you the circuits because we don't know what they are i mean we know that we we have some sense what broad areas get activated we don't understand the circuit level control of this and yet there are sensations like deja vu which we all have experienced there is a feeling of having an intuitive understanding of something which we can subjectively define but we cannot objectively point out the circuit so i i like to recognize the limitations of all disciplines i mean any discipline you work on has its own limitations we don't know the roots and understanding of consciousness and yet we know that in many ways it is produced by the nervous system but i can't tell you an answer i can't give you a clear cut answer so i will have to say that one has to acknowledge what we don't know so intuition goes into zones which we really struggle to understand i am telling you we don't understand joy and joy would be something it would be beautiful to understand we don't understand it there is a, uh, a question from vishali Uh, she's saying whether stress and negative thoughts adversely affect various chronic diseases. Yep, they do because it's not only having an effect on your brain, which of course I study, but it has an effect on your gut. It has an effect on your liver and metabolism. It has effect on your muscles. One of the studies that one of my very talented graduate students did, she said, "You know, I'm tired of studying the brain," which is a fantastic thing for a student to say in a neuroscience lab. She said, "We only study the brain." why have we never looked at the effects of maternal separation on other things and i said oh uh, well uh, i was carrying my own bias of course i like studying the brain but she wanted to push me out of my comfort zone so she said i am not going to study the brain i am going to go study the muscle and the liver and i am going to study metabolism and the periphery and that's what she did in collaboration with ulas kolthur i don't have expertise in that but he's a physiologist so she worked on a collaborative graduate project and she showed that even before some of the changes in the brain you start seeing profound changes at the level of metabolic function in the liver and the muscles so absolutely these are pleiotropic effects nurture there's no reason to believe nurture only affects the brain it also affects multiple other organs the heart being another critical place that does have impact as well so yeah seeds of a diverse variety of disease are are, are sown in early adversity Ah, uh, Nitin is asking uh, a question which may be hard to answer. 
can we stop the anxiety receptors in any way so that uh, we always remain happy? Wow. <laughs> Uh, no, clearly not. So, so okay. So, the fundamental question is: Is there any survival advantage to anxiety? You should not think about anxiety as only pathological anxiety, right? Which the kind of anxiety for which you need to take Valium or benzodiazepines. You need to treat it. There is a reason why anxiety has survived across evolution. It has given you a survival advantage. You, it, it prevents you from doing foolish things. just having a little bit of anxiety and fear is not a bad idea it's a protective circuit also it's when it moves into pathological anxiety that we worry about it so of course you naturally feel nervous before you give a talk or you naturally feel nervous before an exam and a little bit of nervous is not a bad nervousness is not a bad thing a little bit of anxiety is a good thing but pathological anxiety is what you want to avoid where you it paralyzes you and then you can't do anything because it's uh, preventing you from functioning and it's that kind of pathological anxiety that you want to prevent and there are drugs that do prevent that um they don't completely cure it because more often than not they alleviate the symptoms they don't in many psychiatric disorders we have a way to reduce the symptoms we don't have a way of curing the disease we have good ways of reducing symptoms but that's true for both neurological and psychiatric disorders we can treat the symptoms we rarely treat the disease Shivani is asking why why depression is more common among women as compared to men. Good question, and it's a very fundamental question. There's a higher risk rate for women for de depression. I want to tell you one study which I found very fascinating. It's a study that was done in the so okay. Let me just first start by saying yes, depression rates are higher in women. Substance abuse rates are higher in men. This has been seen across the world. Okay. so one would think oh maybe there's just some inherent hormonal reason why this happens yeah. and there could be i'm not precluding that possibility but i want to open up the idea to sociological factors as well which we do not automatically consider social socio cultural factors can have a profound influence also and this comes from one study that was done with the amish community now the amish community is a community in in western pennsylvania and in in sort of in the us which believes in not um, so there's um, it's a way they believe in not accepting modernity in its entirety so they will reject some of the things associated with modernity they live simpler lives they it's a agricultural community that does farming uh, and they don't allow substance abuse that's part of their practice as a community so nobody drinks alcohol alcohol substance abuse is prohibited by the cultural conditioning of that community guess what rates of depression are identical in men and women when you look across the amish community so then there is a debate is it that substance abuse is a form of self medicating for depression and that has been raised because certainly some common pathways arise for substance abuse and depression these are not so clean cut that you can separate them in fact substance abuse is often comorbid with depression an individual has an underlying psychiatric disorder of depression and there's also substance abuse So yes that 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 opens up interesting ideas of whether alcohol abuse drug abuse of a variety of forms also has its underpinnings in similar circuits and why men may turn to that women may actually because they are socio culturally tending not to use substance abuse as much manifest as depression so i just want to open that idea up but it is true that women across the world have higher rates of depression and anxiety whereas the rates in substance abuse are much higher for men we don't really understand it yet uh, this question seems to be a bit uh, personal question so i have not disclosed the name of the student so if a person has experienced stress in early age but later he or she overcomes that and again on some part of time in his life they come with contact with similar stressful situation are they still prone to the previous kind of reaction regarding stress and is there any helpline number or any organization for consultation of this type of the problem yeah so um like i said at the very beginning it's a risk factor it's not a guarantee so just because someone has gone through early i mean there are profound stories of resilience of people who have survived the holocaust people who have survived severe abuse and gone on to thrive in fact one of my absolute heroes is viktor frankl who's one of the survivors of the holocaust and he wrote this entire beautiful book called a man search for meaning which i is one of my absolute favorite books and it is 
about his experiences during the Holocaust. And he talks about his observation. He was a psychiatrist who, were, who was in Auschwitz. He lost his wife, he lost his brother, and he lost his mother during, um, during that entire period. And he talks about the search for hope and the search for meaning through profound pain. And um, it's a remarkable book. It really is a remarkable book. So I think there is there are amazing um, reservoirs of resilience within all humans. So there's no reason to believe that people do not surmount their circumstances. They do, but there is also the reality that there are um, that there are sometimes one needs both the therapy, the cognitive behavior therapy, and sometimes one may need medication. There's absolutely no reason why one should not reach out for support when it is required. And one should not hesitate. It's not a character weakness if you get a psychiatric disorder. We are all at risk for it. Absolutely. Okay, there's no reason to believe that just because somebody develops a psychiatric disorder, that's their fault. How can it be? Uh, you know, it is a consequence of changes in the neurochemistry within your nervous system. There's no reason one person will get it and another person won't. There sometimes are, yes, there are risk factors. Adversity is a risk factor, but sometimes it is also genetic. There's genetic predisposition. So one has to understand that and one has to first accept that it is not a character flaw. And there's no, I mean, you know, when somebody gets diabetes, nobody tells them this is a character flaw of yours. You have got diabetes. You, why have you got diabetes? You know, people get anxiety and depression. People look at them with suspicion as to why have you got it? You must have done something wrong to be suffering from the, no. I, even with a patient of substance abuse, you cannot treat them as, it, you know, it, it hijacks your brain neurochemistry. And by hijacking your brain, it, you require the treatment to recover from these disorders. There's no shame at all in seeking it out. And one should comfortably seek it out and take the help that is required and it is available. There are, um, there are helplines. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but absolutely online, you would find it with, um, if you're on Twitter, I would recommend Swamitra Pathare, other organization, Nimhans. They, they, they're absolutely available to reach out to. Don't hesitate. Some of the finest minds of our time have been challenged with deep psychiatric illness and have surmounted it. Okay, some of our greatest geniuses and our people whom we look at and we say, wow, what an incredible human being this is. And they have lived with profound illness and, and surmounted it. So there's really no reason why people cannot recover. People do recover. We see this even in our animal models. We see recovery. We see resilience. In fact, that's one of the things that we are so interested in, what underlies this kind of resilient response. And I keep telling my lab, as much as we study susceptibility, so too we should study resilience. Because it's the other side of that very same extremely important coin. Uh, this is the last question. It is from Rukhsana. She's asking whether animals also undergo depression. For example, if the owner of a dog dies, what happens to the dog? Uh, you're asking such a phenomenal question. You know, I, I mean, I discussed this with my lab just philosophically. Because, I, I mean, we have no way of a subjective asking, right? We can't ask or inquire, how are you feeling? This is what allows us to ask each other, how are you feeling? What do you feel? And yet, um, examples of what one considers classical grief have been seen in elephants, have been seen in cats and dogs. Um, they've been seen when conspecifics have, um, have passed away. I don't know if you've ever seen when a crow dies, how the crows gather. You know, I mean, it almost looks like they're mourning. And now there's no way for us to inquire about this. And yet one has seen it with elephants where they will go back to the location where, for example, a young elephant has died and they will sit there and they will just sit in that presence, in that location for a period. They have phenomenal memories, they have great cognitive complexity. So do dolphins, so do other cetaceans. Whales do it too. I mean, it's a, it's a question we don't know an answer to. And of course, there is a risk that we tend to anthropomorphize and say that they have the feelings that we have. But there's the equal risk to say that they don't have the feelings we have because they can't describe it. So we don't really know the answer to this. But there are, um, there are lots of studies where people have looked at what they consider markers of grief in other species. And um, there are some things that look remarkably like grief in humans. Uh, and absolutely, those who are pet lovers and who have a dog and have a bond with a dog will easily share the kind of affinity and the social connectedness that that dog feels with its owner. Difficult. I can't answer it without, I would, if I, if you ask me for not a non-scientific answer and a personal answer, I'll say, why would it only be something we are endowed with? I would say, I would be surprised if very other cognitively complex species do not feel that kind of pain. They feel 
so many other things that we feel that they feel attachment if you feel that degree of social attachment and you show that social you can i can imagine that you will feel distress when that attachment is taken away so yeah uh, we were compiling but another question has come in which may be interesting for the audience that is uh, the student is asking can phobias be cured or they have any relationship to the critical period sorry can can what be cured phobia Cope, can coping be cured phobia any type of phobia any phobia oh yes 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 absolutely phobias can be cured i have acrophobia i will declare my phobia i'm very scared of uh, you know if you go to the himalayas it's beautiful once you reach there i have no problem if i'm on my own feet but those horrible ghats that you have to traverse i i definitely get the full fledged sweating palms accelerating heart rate which are the classical stress responses right um but i know that exposing yourself to that environment under controlled conditions such that you feel safe in that environment that's a classical way in which people do phobia therapy uh, another uh, phobia the arachnophobia where people have tested this most people have paralytic fear of big spiders you know you have a huge tarantula spider and the person has a i mean to the extent that you look at their stress response and you measure their salivary cortisol and it's gone through the roof because they have such a severe arachnophobia people have blocked that by using beta blockers by doing exposure therapy and they've cured people so yes absolutely phobias are curable uh, usually it's done under the guidance of a counselor or a therapist and sometimes it's just exposure therapy sometimes it's exposure therapy with a drug many cases people have used things like beta blockers propranolol being a classic example which is a drug that actually can help in such um, such conditions Ah, uh, probably that's all. Uh, over to Dr. Bharti for the final words. Uh, thank you, Vijita. That was a fantastic talk with wonderful interactive session, and it's a bit soul searching for me as well. I keep on thinking whole night that what is happening to the brain and what how the anxiety can be controlled. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed interacting with you all, and I hope that someday we will do this in person, and that I come come to Punjab rather than doing yeah. this. Over You're always welcome. Thank, Thank you so much. My pleasure.